Uh, good evening. Thank you for inviting me to take part in this evening's occasion. I'm sorry I can't be with you. I'm actually at this point in Warsaw, where I'm at a meeting of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, particularly with emphasis on the Migration Committee, of which I'm, a, of which I'm an active member. <clears throat> but you know I came on a kinder transport from Prague at the age of six in 1939. Uh, it was quite a traumatic experience, of course, arriving, arriving in London. Uh, we had a commemoration in Harwich a few weeks ago of the arrival of kinder transport children in Harwich, a large event. There was a, a statue made of children arriving. The local MP was there, the, the mayor was there, and we commemorated the arrival of the children, including myself, of course, uh, at the harbor in Harwich on that day. I then, more recently, went to Prague where we had an event to commemorate the Kinder Transport children and Nicky Winton, who of course was responsible or led many of the Kinder Transport um, uh, policies uh, and, and achievements uh, from Prague. And uh, it was to commemorate him. Uh, we met at Prague Station, from which I'd left over 80 years before. Uh, the Prime Minister, the Czech Prime Minister was there, we talked a bit. <coughs> and then many of us went out, out of Prague to a small village by train because we were planting trees to commemorate Nicky Winton. Uh, and it was a great occasion. Lots of people were there, um, uh, Bastards and other people, and, and it, was, it was important, important to commemorate Nicky Winton. And the Czechs responded very well, very positively to, to this as, a, as part, of the, part of the history. Um, for my arrival in this country, <coughs> I, I, um, I was interested in politics from an early age, not from the age of six. And I should say I remember my journey. I remember leaving Prague Station. My mother was there, anxious, German soldiers with swastikas in the background. The train took a long time, left late at night. The following night we arrived at the Dutch border. The older ones cheered because we were out of reach of the Nazis. Uh, I knew it was significant, but I didn't understand why. And um, uh, I was looking for uh, windmills and wooden shoes. Well, I couldn't see any, of course. That was my, my vision of Holland. And, and then, and then we, the train went to Hooker for Holland, and then by boat to Harwich, and then by train to Liverpool Street, where we arrived, and where there is another statue commemorating the kinder transport children, children arriving there. And this was London just before the war, and London preparing for the inevitability of war. So there was an atmosphere um, which I probably didn't understand fully. Uh, I had to learn English. I spoke Czech and German at that point. And, and, and my father, who escaped from Prague immediately, the Nazis came in. He, he, he was looking after me. And uh, anyway, I had to learn English. So to cut a long story short, um, I progressed. At an early age, I became passionately interested in politics. People ask me why. I suppose because I was trying to understand why what had happened to me had happened. Uh, and I was trying to puzzle out. And I suppose I came to the conclusion, I think I did, that if evil men can do what they did through their politics, then possibly politics can also be used to reverse the process and do things for the better. At any rate, my, passionately, my passionate interest in politics right through the 1945 general election and so on, when we were living in Manchester, I knew all the Labour candidates in, um, in Manchester, uh, passionately interested in politics. Uh, and, 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 uh, and so I decided at some point I would like to get involved. I felt as a refugee that it really wasn't appropriate to aim for parliament, so I aimed for a local council. But I, I tried, uh, I, I was persuaded to have a go. Um, eventually, I, I stood for the cities of London and Westminster, the central constituency in London, and in the 1970 election, and my opponent was Christopher Tugendhat. Uh, so we had a refugee from Vienna competing with a refugee from Prague for the central constituency in, in this country. Of course, he won, he was a safe conservative seat, and he went on to become a, a European commissioner, and we're both now fellow members of, 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 the, of the House of Lords. Throughout the period of my political activity, I was always interested, inevitably, in the cause of refugees. And when I was in the House of Commons, which I eventually reached, I, I was responsible as a shadow minister for immigration and refugee policy. I then lost my seat and I became uh, head of the Refugee Council, an NGO looking after refugees, and then I was put in the Lords. If I can come to the more recent, uh, the more recent position, I was... Um, I was in the Lords when an immigration bill was going through. And at that time, uh, 
the background was the, 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 the terrible situation in Syria. And a lot of refugees were coming from, from Syria. Uh, and uh, many of them went to Germany, but some of them came, uh, got as far as France. And what happened, what happened was that the immigration bill was going through and, and the co friends in the commons with whom I was discussing it said, look, it's a good chance to, to, put, to, put, to put a bill down, uh, an amendment to the bill. And there were, uh, at that time we'd heard there were <coughs> 70, 80, 90,000 child refugees somewhere in Europe. And so I put down an amendment to the immigration bill when it was going to the Lords uh, to say that we should take some of them, mainly from Calais uh, and possibly from the Greek islands. And um, I put the amendment down and everybody got very excited about it. The, the immigration bill was going through the Lords, so I put down an amendment to the effect that we should take some unaccompanied child refugees. And this caused a certain amount of excitement. I don't know why. Uh, at any rate, Theresa May was then the Home Secretary. I'd met her before because Nicky Winton was a constituent of hers in Maidenhead. And at one of Nicky Winton's birthday parties, I'd actually met Theresa May. At any rate, she summoned me into her office and asked me to withdraw the amendment. And I said, why? And she said, well, if these children come, others will follow. And I said, but we can't turn our back on children who are sleeping off in, in an awful situation of the jungle in Calais or, or who are sleeping off on the Greek islands. We can't turn our back on them. We can't leave them. So we parted company. So my amendment passed the Lords by a big majority. It got to the Commons where it was slightly defeated. I was sitting in the public gallery looking at the MPs. It was quite interesting how some of them looked at me and looked a bit guilty. So I thought they're not going to vote for it. And it, the amendment went back to the Lords and we had a bigger majority. And then something remarkable happened. Public opinion woke up to what was going on. I think it was a filming of people drowning in the Mediterranean. There was a little Syrian boy called Alan Kurdi who was drowned on the Mediterranean beach. And I think the British public woke up to what was happening. And so uh, I was walking down the street locally here and um, somebody shouted. Now, when people shout at politicians, it's normally abuse. But it wasn't abuse. It was actually keep going with your amendment. It was nice to have that sort of comment in the street. And indeed, most of the comments were favorable. And all over the country, people started setting up support groups for refugees. Now, um, that was spontaneous. And I think it brought some pressure to bear on those MPs who were likely to support the government and it made them change their minds. And I should say throughout the process, I endeavored never to have the cause of refugees as a matter of the property of one political party. I was always determined that it should be cross-party and we should seek support across the piece uh, from wherever we could get it. And so Theresa May asked me to go and see her again after it had passed the Lords the Amendment. And she said the government proposed to accept the amendment. So that was pretty good, although they kept the numbers down but it was a success. The second big issue on this was, as we were leaving the EU, uh, there had been a treaty for EU members called the Dublin Treaty, under part of which a child refugee in one European country could apply to join family in another, and we called that the Dublin Three provision. And I moved an amendment which would make it obligatory for the government to negotiate with the EU to continue that particular arrangement even after we left the EU. <coughs> and that passed in the Lords and the government accepted it. And then in, in the 2019 legislation, they pulled it out again. And I had quite a, quite a row with government ministers because it meant that the door to child, children coming for family reunion was, was, was pretty well blocked. So we've got an atmosphere that isn't too sympathetic to refugees. Over the years, I don't remember what it was like in 1939 when I arrived because I was too young to really understand you know, the, the nuances of public opinion and what people thought. But subsequently, there was quite a warm welcome for the Hungarians who fled after the Hungarian uprising. And gradually, sympathy became less. And indeed, in other parts of Europe as well, we have seen that sympathy becoming less for refugees. Uh, the trouble is that if leading politicians make hostile comments, then that is interpreted in local communities as being, as being opposition. And then local communities are less positive and less responsive. So it, there's a sort of knock-on effect. I, I, if I can go back to Calais for a bit, uh, I've been there several times, 
and the jungle was partly cleared before I got there. And in the little street, it's all gone now, the people are sleeping under the trees. It's all, in the little street in the middle of the jungle in Cali, there were, there, there, were, there were displays of tear gas canisters and rubber bullets. And I said, what are they for? And they said the then French government was very worried about the activities of the National Front in that part of Calais. And uh, they were determined to be pretty aggressive in clearing the first part of the camp. And I said, but you know, you don't defeat fascism by behaving like the fascists. At any rate, they then cleared the rest of the camp, and so people are now sleeping under the trees. I should make one other comment, though, about my visits to some of these camps. Um, there were some remarkable volunteers, mainly but not exclusively from this country, who go there to work in the camps and support refugees, child refugees and others. And this is a pretty brave effort to go there and live in difficult conditions uh, and to help their fellow human beings. And these people, these young people from Britain, don't get enough praise for what they're doing, giving up a year or two of their lives. There are also some excellent not, uh, NGOs, volunteer organizations, with whom I'm associated, like Safe Passage and so on, who again do a great deal of work for refugees. And they all deserve far more tributes because they work in difficult circumstances uh, and, and they work well and they work effectively. We've now got the position of the, of the Ukrainian uh, refugees and there's been a warmer welcome for them than perhaps for some of the other refugees like those from Afghanistan and, and, uh, and Syria. Uh, and we can speculate on why that is. Uh, certainly one reason must be that the television cameras have shown us, shown us much more of what's going on in, 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 um, in Ukraine than we've ever seen from Syria or Afghanistan or the Horn of Africa. So maybe people are more aware of it. Maybe they feel more sympathy with people who are Europeans and who are white Christians. Uh, so that also, that also is part of it. But the background is still that there's been opposition to refugees in quite a lot of countries, maybe less for the Ukrainians, in quite a lot of countries. Um, uh, German elections uh, showed, showed the extreme right-wing party doing well. The Hungarians have been opposed to refugees for a long time. It's been the case in Austria. It's been the case in Italy and in France. So there are right -wing, extreme right-wing political parties in Europe who are taking advantage of the refugee situation and exploiting it for their, for their own political ends. Now, let me just tell you one little story uh, uh, that happened recently. There was, um, I got very much involved, uh, as I have done often, uh, and, uh, and this is a case of a Ukrainian family. The mother, the father is fighting. The mother is in the occupied part or near the occupied part, looking after other members of her family. And the 17-year-old daughter um, w was further west, but still in a war zone. And she'd applied for a visa to come to Britain. We had a host family arranged near Birmingham. The host family had been vetted, so they conformed to all the safeguards. The school had been vetted. The local authority was happy. And yet the government said, no, she can't come. There are not enough safeguarding measures. I thought, this is shocking. What could be more dangerous than a 17-year-old girl in a war zone, so frightened that she locks the door at night because she didn't go out? What could be an example of a more vulnerable human being. And everything, the safeguarding measures were in place. At any rate, I, 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 had, I raised it twice in Parliament. I had two meetings with the minister. And, and I said to him, look, what can I do? This is awful. And he was quite sympathetic. Eventually, he said, shout at me, shout at me. And with a bit of pressure, the girl was here. And I had a meal with, with her and the host family uh, just uh, two, two weeks ago. But there are others in the same position, and they have they also come over. So I'm saying this is, that is an example of where we just got to fight and, and, and work for the human rights of these people. I'm going to finish with just one little story. I went to um, uh, Jordan. There's a refugee camp there called Zatari. It has 70 to 80,000 people. Physically, it's better than Calais or the Greek islands. It's better because it's got prefab buildings, it's got sanitation, uh, it's got electricity, it's got all that. And, and um, I was talking to a young Syrian, about 17, uh, 17 years old. And remember, this camp is about 60 kilometers from the, uh, from the Syrian border. And I said, well, what's your situation? He said, well, I've been to school, finished my school in the camp. That's good. I'm trying to get a job in the camp. I can't. He said, um, I can't get a job outside the camp. What do I do? And it made me realize that what we have to offer is hope for refugees. 
because people can, my experience, people can put up with very difficult political circumstances if there is some hope at the end of the line. And it is hope we have to offer. And I believe this country should be more welcoming of refugees because it is hope we can offer them. And we should, we can't take them all, but we should take a handful of them. We're only taking a few anyway. We can take a few more, a few more than we're taking now. Uh, we are in, in order of countries, we're about 17th or 18th in relation to size in Europe. So we're way down the list. But we can give people hope by taking some more of the refugees, particularly child refugees. Hope is the word that matters in, in that cause. And so that's what, where I hope you will support it. And I hope you will all talk to your members of parliament and urge them to have a government that will be as sympathetic to refugees as possible. Thank you.